today I want to focus on this really important story that you find in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 17, the story of the Transfiguration. But funny enough, I don't want to focus on the main part of the story, but a particular line which might seem to be of incidental importance. So as you might recall, in the context of the story of the Transfiguration, Jesus Christ takes his three main disciples, Peter, James, and John, and they go up this mountain, at which point Jesus Christ is transfigured. His clothes become dazzling white, his face becomes radiant, and he appears in the presence of Moses and Elijah, who represent in turn the Law and the Prophets. And basically what you hear from the heavens is the Father shouting, This is my beloved Son, listen to him. Peter is so enamored with the experience, he wants to build a couple of tents. And perhaps we might say that the main takeaway message with regards to the story is basically twofold. First of all, that Jesus Christ truly is the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah, the fulfillment of, again, the Law and the Prophets. But secondly, this idea that Jesus Christ is fortifying the disciples for that which is to come. The crucifixion, of course, is just around the corner, and therefore the Lord wants to give his disciples this really powerful and, again, consoling experience to fortify them for that which is to come. You know, that said, the thing I want to focus on with regards to this particular story is this line that the Lord says in the aftermath of the Transfiguration. And so basically what he says to his disciples is, tell no one about all these things which have happened until the Son of Man has come back from the dead. Which speaks to the fact that even though eventually, obviously in time, the disciples will be called to share this really beautiful and powerful experience with other people, quite frankly, that time is not now. Right now, the time is to wait, to ponder, to pray into the thing, to deepen their experience of this particular moment, and then share this moment with the people of God, again, at the appropriate time. And so to kind of frame this thing we're talking about today using a somewhat contemporary example, I remember recently listening to this podcast in the context of which this really famous stand-up comedian was being interviewed. And so as a matter of background, this person had basically fallen into hard times. And so back in the day, he did something kind of objectively wrong as a result of which he was basically canceled by the culture. But now he was trying to recover and kind of get his life back and make a living and provide for his family using the craft of stand-up comedy. And so now he's being interviewed on the podcast that kind of shares experience of kind of rising from the ashes, if you will. And for me, one of the best parts of the interview was when one of the co-hosts of the podcast basically asked this guy, you know, more or less, what's your approach to life now in light of everything you've endured? And I think in retrospect, she was looking for basically a joke, some variation of like, look, in light of everything I've suffered, in light of the public humiliation that I've endured, basically I don't care anymore. And so now I feel the freedom to tell any sort of vulgar or an inappropriate joke regardless of the consequences. But instead, what he basically suggested was that back in the day, he used to think that the main goal was to have absolutely no separation between his public life and his private life. Whereas now he realizes that there's a real value to separating that which is up for public consumption and that which is meant to be private, that which is meant to be hidden, that which is meant to be sacred, if you will, right? As a bit of a side note, I think it's kind of interesting that this guy apparently is a fallen away Catholic, right? And so even though he doesn't practice his faith right now, at the same time, in a certain sense, he seems to kind of maintain certain Catholic sensibilities, if you will. And again, that's conveyed in this particular concept. Because it's true, we're called to maintain a strict separation between that which is up for public consumption, and again, that which is meant to be private, hidden, and again, dare we say, sacred. And funny enough, that's precisely what you find up and down the gospel in numerous places, right? And so think, for example, of the gospel of Matthew chapter 7. And so in the context of this particular passage, the Lord says very famously that we're called not to give what is holy before dogs, or to throw your pearls before swine, lest they trample these things underfoot and then turn around and maul you. And so again, this clear invitation to maintain the strict separation, if you will, between that which is up for public consumption and that which is meant to be private, hidden, and sacred. But you know, that said, perhaps the most striking example of this particular thing we're talking about today in the context of the gospel is found in the gospel of Matthew chapter 13, particularly when the Lord tells a series of parables dealing with the kingdom of heaven. And so you'll notice that of these seven parables, the Lord doesn't actually explain these parables in the context of the gospel, except for two the parable of the sower and the parable of the weeds and the wheat. But you see, the thing I want to draw your attention to in a certain sense is the manner in which he explains these two parables, and in particular the timing by which he goes about this particular explanation. And so funny enough, he doesn't simply tell the parable and then explain it immediately afterwards. And but instead what he does, it's kind of interesting, he first of all tells the parable, and then basically he and the disciples, they get on with their lives. They pray, they work, they teach, they do their apostolic thing, and then only after that do they come back together, at which point Jesus then, and only then, explains the nature of the parable. But you see, it speaks to the fact that none of it is wasted time, right? And so when they're engaging in all these things, again, the praying, the waiting, the teaching, the, the working, all these things are contributing to deepen their sense of the experience. 
such that when the time comes to receive more information about that particular experience or to receive a further explanation of that same experience, they're ready. And it prepares them for sharing their experience eventually in time with other people. Okay, now at this point, perhaps I'm going to end with a few contemporary examples just to kind of drive the point home. And so first of all, in terms of my own kind of personal experience, I remember back in the day when I first started giving retreats, I gave a retreat to a particular group, which in retrospect was used to receiving retreats that were kind of more dressed up, if you will, more games, more music, that type of thing. But I only gave them like a straight up talk, you know, talking about the things of God and spiritual things. And I found out afterwards that they weren't really sure once the retreat was done, whether or not they even liked it. And so for a lot of them, just to kind of paraphrase, I think a lot of them were kind of in that experience and subjectively not being sure, but also maybe even not liking it, thinking it was boring or whatever the case may be. But then funny enough, and again, I found this out through back channels, as you know, the days kind of passed from the end of the retreats, a lot of them continued to talk to each other and they realized that a lot of things that I was saying during the retreat were kind of coming back to them as they were kind of living their lives and kind of talking to each other and kind of reflecting on the whole thing. And through that reflection, they realized that the Holy Spirit was actually working in the context of our time together in a way which they recognized only after a certain amount of time had passed and after the experience that had been allowed to deepen and ripen, if you will. Okay, one final example, and I'll kind of end with this. And so back in the day, I was talking to one of my good friends who was a missionary at this Catholic summer camp. And basically, at the end of the camp, she attended this concluding retreat at which all the missionaries were present and the vocations director was basically giving a speech. And what he said to them, it was a really amazing bit of advice. What he said was that even though you've all had amazing experiences in terms of the preparation for giving this camp and also obviously in facilitating this particular camp, at the same time, I would caution you to not share your experience with other people prematurely. No, obviously he wasn't saying don't evangelize and nor was he saying don't share the good news of what God has done in your life with other people. But instead what he was suggesting to people was wait. Let the experience ripen and deepen over a long period of time. And again, don't speak about that same experience with other people prematurely because you might not do justice to the thing and you might actually cheapen the experience by speaking about it prematurely. And you know, for me personally, I really love that last story because it really helps to illustrate, you know, the beauty and majesty by which God brings about his grace in our lives or transforms our hearts. Because the whole idea is that, you know, certainly the Lord plants seeds, right? He plants seeds in our hearts, he plants seeds in our lives. And yeah, we're called to collaborate with these different things, but in very simple ways, you know, live your life, work, pray, wait, allow these seeds to develop and flourish and, and become fruitful over time. And the whole idea is that you don't have to work at it. And so when the time comes to share your experience with other people, to share the good news about what God has done in your life, you'll do so with confidence, with bravery, with excitement, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And when the time comes to speak about what the Lord has done in your life, your heart will be full. And may God bless you all.